Today we're reading from Psalm 22, verses 23 to 31. Praise the Lord, all you who fear him. Honor him, all you descendants of Jacob. Show him reverence, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not ignored or belittled the sufferings of the needy. He has not turned his back on them, but he has listened to their cries for help. I will praise you in the great assembly. I will fulfill my vows in the presence of those who worship you. The poor will eat and be satisfied. All who seek the Lord will praise him. Their hearts will rejoice with everlasting joy. The whole earth will acknowledge the Lord and return to him. All the families of the nations will bow down before him. For the royal power belongs to the Lord. He rules all the nations. Let the rich of the earth fe feast and worship. Uh, bow before him all who are mortal, all whose lives will end in, as dust. Our children will also serve him. Future generations will hear the, the wonders of the Lord. His righteous acts will be told to those not yet born. They will hear about everything he has done. Well, good morning, and I just want to give a big thank you to Armand and Bree for taking the time to read the psalm for us this morning. Uh, what a great reminder it is that our God is a God that is worthy to be praised and that all dominion belongs to him. And that fits in really well to where we're going in our sermon series this morning. But before we get there, I just have a quick reminder for you. So today, Sunday, we are going to be doing our SEMC Chili Dog Day. So normally we would do this in person, but today we get to do it online. So go get your favorite bowl of chili and your favorite hot dog and hot dog bun and then put them together and take a picture and then post it online with the hashtag SEMC Chili Dog Sunday. And we're gonna share these pictures and interact with each other in these pictures. And it's gonna be a great time. So I just encourage you to, to do that with us here today. Now, if you have your Bibles with you, we're, today we're gonna be looking in, uh, in the book of Isaiah. And we're going to be looking at ch in chapter 40, verses 9 to 17. So Isaiah chapter 40, verses 9 to 17. So that's what we're going to read together. But what I would encourage you to do is, uh, is read through the whole passage here. So from, from chapter 40, verses 9 uh, to 31. Hit that pause button and, uh, and continue to read through the rest of the passage. And then come back as we sort of unpack this teaching together. The word of the Lord says this. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend to his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. When I was growing up, we would always say grace before having a meal together as a family. My brother and I, each and every night, would recite a prayer that our parents taught us. Maybe you've heard it or something like it before. It goes like this. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for this food. Amen. Has a nice jingle to it. To this day, I love this prayer. It's simple and it's not full of big theological church words. It first recognizes who God is. God is great. God is good. It then goes on to remind us that because of his greatness and his goodness, we have received our daily bread, our daily nourishment, and for that reason, we offer our thanks not just for the often delicious food that we would eat as children, but for who God is. 
Needless to say, this isn't something that I fully recognize as an eight-year-old, but it is something that I continue to grow in my understanding of as a 33-year-old. Yet that word, great, is one that we use so commonly today in conversation when trying to be descriptive. For example, we use great as a descriptive word for God, and we also perhaps use it as a descriptive word for steak or a cup of coffee. Or maybe we use it to describe a certain way that we feel. And sometimes we like to use the word great as a word to just fill the space without having to offer an honest opinion of something. Maybe we say that that steak we ordered is great when maybe we asked for it medium rare and it came medium well. Maybe we say that that cup of coffee is great when maybe it's just mediocre and maybe too weak or too strong depending on your preference. And maybe, just maybe, when somebody asks us how we are doing, we say we are doing great when really we aren't. I want to encourage you this morning to not think of God's greatness as a descriptive word that we've used in these examples, but to look at God's greatness as a characteristic, a consistent and unchanging characteristic that is not dependent on day or time or circumstance. Greatness is not just what God does, but who he is. Understanding the vastness and completeness of God's greatness is quite honestly impossible for us, but he has revealed his greatness to us in this passage in a couple of different ways, and that's what we are going to examine together. Before we do that, let's bow our heads in prayer. Merciful God, we love you. And we take this time together because we desire to draw closer to you and to learn more about you. And so we pray this morning, Lord, that as we unpack what it means to understand your greatness in the ways that you've revealed to us, that you would help us to use these, use these things that we're taught and these, these understandings that we come to terms with as ways in which we can then worship you and we can live our lives in response to the goodness and the greatness that you've blessed us with. In your name we pray. Now, chapter 40 in Isaiah represents uh, the beginning of a much broader prophetic message that God is revealing to his people who are currently in exile. Just as a brief historical refresher, the Babylonian exile happened in the 6th century BC. The Jewish people were deported from Jerusalem and taken into Babylon, where they were held captive for roughly 50 years. In Babylon, they suffered greatly and faced lots of different cultural and spiritual pressures. The Babylonian exile ultimately happened because of sin. Time and time again, God called Israel to live in the way he desired for them, worshiping him alone and being a nation set apart in holiness. However, Israel continuously disobeyed God by worshiping false idols and living in a way that was against God's desire for his people. This is what ultimately led to the exile. These were greatly trying and troubled times for the Israelites. But even in their oppression and circumstances that they brought on themselves, God was still at work amongst his people. Babylon would not determine the future and fate of Israel, but God would. God was still working through his people while in a foreign land and was speaking the promise of hope to them through the prophet. God is faithful to his promises, and he was committed to seeing his people thrive as a nation, even in their disobedience and sin. Now, there were consequences for their choices, certainly, but God was still faithful to his promises through them. In this passage, Isaiah reminds Israel of the greatness of God, not just of the greatness of God, but ultimately who God is. We're going to look at two of the ways he reminds Israel of who God is. He first points to God as the great creator, and he secondly points to God as the great shepherd. Saying that God is the creator recognizes that he created everything. The heavens and the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars. He created all living creatures as well as mankind. Creation is an act which is introduced at the very beginnings of Scripture, but God existed before the very beginnings of Scripture. 
God is eternal and therefore has always existed. He has no beginning and no end. He just chose in his infinite wisdom to reveal himself to us as he began his creation of the universe as we know it. God existed for eternity prior to the book of Genesis. When Genesis 1 recites in the beginning, that is our understanding of the beginning, but not God's. This can be a difficult concept to wrap one's head around. But when we do recognize and understand it, it's also a very humbling realization. God didn't need us. He existed for eternity prior without us, but he chose to create us and give us life. He chose to love us and allow us to love him, all for the purpose of bringing him glory through relationship with us. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. God created all things, visible and invisible. Whether we can see it or not see it, God created it. All governments, rulers, authorities were created by him and put in place by him. All things were created through him and for him. It's not just the act of creation itself that is worthy of praise, but the creator through whom everything was created. He created all things for his glory and his glory alone. He didn't create us to exist without being in relationship with him. Rather, he created us to bring himself glory through relationship with us. Unless we are in relationship with God, we aren't living in the way in which he intended for us to live. But rather, we are living in the way which puts us above him. When we choose to live within God's beautiful creation, creation as owner and operator rather than inhabitant and servant, we are ultimately making ourselves gods, choosing right from wrong, good from bad, and choosing for ourselves how to live. That's what Adam and Eve did, and it didn't end so well for them. When the serpent was talking to Eve, he convinced her that when she ate of the fruit, her eyes would be opened and she would be like God, knowing good and evil. So what did Eve do? She ate of the fruit. But she didn't become like God, and neither did Adam. Rather, they disobeyed and sinned against him. And ultimately, that's what we do when we don't submit to God as the creature, rather than trying to convince ourselves to live as the creator. Recognizing not just what God has done in creation, but also looking at who God is as the creator of everything gives us an authentic understanding of why he created us. The very act of creation expresses and reveals to us a loving, relationally driven, great God who desires to know us and be known by us. Now, the second way that God relates to us in this passage is as the great shepherd. In this passage and throughout scripture, we also see a beautifully painted picture of God as our shepherd, one who cares for his sheep and rescues them from themselves and from those who wish to do them harm. Often a shepherd has to move his flock of sheep from one pasture to another. He always does what is best for his sheep. But sometimes it's not easy to get them from point A to point B. When a shepherd walks with a sheep, it's not just all green pastures and easy terrain, but often it can be quite difficult. But the shepherd keeps his sheep together. The shepherd provides food and water for the sheep. The shepherd guides them in the right direction so they don't get lost. The shepherd protects the sheep from enemies that wish to devour them. Without the shepherd, the sheep have no direction, no provision, and no protection. But the sheep need to be willing to hear the shepherd, listen to the shepherd over their own voice. In the Old Testament, after God has brought his people out of oppression and slavery in Egypt, he tells them that he will take them to the promised land, and that will be their inheritance. And he does that. He takes them through the desert, provides for them, and prepares them to enter the promised land. God is shepherding his people in the wilderness, preparing them for what is to come. Then when they finally arrive at the land that the Lord has promised after so long, 
they saw that the people that they had to take the land from, whom the Lord had promised they would, were greater and stronger, and their cities were fortified and extended all the way up to the heavens. And they were scared. They were scared of the circumstances that were in front of them, and they forgot about the greatness of Yahweh. God said, go, and his people said, no. Then God's anger was kindled and said to them, not one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land that I promised you. And then the people went, oh, shoot. Okay, you know what? We will go. But then they went in and the Lord wasn't with them and they were defeated in battle. They had missed their opportunity. They had forgotten about the greatness of their God over the trials that were in front of them. The next 40 years were spent wandering the wilderness, waiting for the generation to pass away so that the next generation could enter into the land that the Lord had promised them. But even in that time in the wilderness, God continued to provide for his people. He continued to shepherd them through those difficult years. That's why this excerpt, excerpt from this passage in Isaiah would be so powerful for the nation of Israel to hear. It's a reminder that God is their shepherd. The same shepherd that brought them out of Egypt, walked with them in the wilderness, and will one day continue to shepherd them the way he did before. And this is ultimately seen in the coming of God in the world, in the person and work of Jesus. Jesus says in, in John chapter 10, verses 7 to 11, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Jesus reveals himself as the good shepherd, the one who lays down his life for us, the one by whom we have direct access to God. Jesus says in this passage that when we follow him as our shepherd, we don't just survive, but we live a life of abundance. Jesus is our shepherd and he continues to care for us each and every day that we live. God is the great shepherd manifested in Jesus Christ. He desires to guide us and provide for us throughout all the days of our life. So what do we do with all this? Well, the first thing I would want to encourage you with is to trust in who God is. At its core, one of the fundamental meanings of faith is trust. Trusting in God means not trusting our own instincts, intuitions, or desires, but rather trusting the one who created us and shepherds us to know what is best for us. If we say we have faith, but we trust in ourselves over God, we don't just have a trust issue, but ultimately we have a faith issue. Often in today's society, we can fall into the mindset of thinking that what someone does defines who they are. In fact, we often ascribe far more value to what one does than who one is. But people are flawed, and often people make mistakes. We've all been there. We've all said something dumb and regretted it or acted in a way that we were ashamed of. Yes, the way one acts is an expression of who they are, but often emotions are imperfectly expressed. Words are improperly delivered, and our response to situations can be harsh and reactive. I think if I were to ask you if, if every one of your actions over the past week was an authentic expression of who you are as an individual, you might think back and find something that you said or did that might cause you to say no. And I'm right there with you. Often I hear people talk about what God is doing in their lives. And it's exciting to hear how the Lord is working in their lives and leading them through whatever season they find themselves in. But it seems just as often I hear people ask where God is because he's currently being silent in their lives. This is the fundamental point about whether we trust in who God is or trust in God in so far as that he meets our expectations. Sometimes God does speak to us and reveal to us directly his will, but sometimes God is also silent. Trusting God means stepping out in faith when he calls us to something, regardless of the circumstances we find ourselves in. But it also means that when God is silent, 
we remember that God is still working. The silence of God is being used to teach you something, lead you to repentance, and help you grow. Let's remember that trusting God should not be conditional just on what we perceive God does or doesn't do, but rather our foundational trust in him is based on who he is as he's revealed to us. Now, please don't misunderstand. What God has done is incredibly important. The salvation that has been earned through Jesus Christ is a gracious, merciful, and loving action and could only be accomplished by the actions of our God. But foundationally, that comes from a gracious, merciful, and loving God. When we trust in who God is, then we trust more deeply in what God does. And because we recognize who God is, we can trust that whatever God chooses to do in our lives and in the lives of those around us, that it's for the good of those who love him. The second thing that I want to encourage you to do is listen for the voice of Jesus. In John 10, 27, just a little further on in the previous passage we read, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. The world is full of noise, disruption, and ultimately things that fight for your attention and focus. It can be easy to get caught up in the ways of the world without even recognizing it. We must remember to look to and listen for Jesus, our shepherd, for guidance, security, and provision. The main way that we hear Jesus' voice is by being in the word, opening up scripture and reading what Jesus has already spoken to us trusting in him for our salvation, and then living in the way in which Jesus has called us to live. Sometimes it might seem radical. Sometimes it might seem countercultural. Sometimes it might seem like you're living against the grain. But Jesus promises that when we hear his voice, he knows us. He gives us eternal life and we will never perish. Friends, if you have put your trust in Jesus, he has secured a spot for you in his kingdom. Regardless of circumstances that you face right now, you are still being led by the shepherd who has laid down his life for you so that you can, let, so that you can live. Do we have our eyes on our shepherd? Are we listening for his voice when he speaks to us? Are we trusting in him to lead us rather than for us to lead ourselves? The greatness of God is beyond comparison. Any analogy we use, any descriptive terms that we use fall short of truly identifying his greatness. Yet he has provided us several ways in which we can trust and relate to him as our God. May we trust in the great God who created the universe as we know it and follow the voice of the great Messiah who redeemed us out of his gracious, merciful, and loving nature. Greatness is not just what God does, but who God is. Let's pray. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you are all powerful and you are also all merciful. Thank you, Lord, that your grace extends to those who don't even know that they need your grace. And Father, we pray that we would be your hands and your feet and that we would speak to the light of Jesus in the world in dark circumstances. Father, we pray that you would go before us in all things, and more importantly, that we would recognize that you go before us in all things, that you are the creator of the universe, that you created us in your image, and that you continue to shepherd us all the days of our lives. Father, remind us that we are not alone, Lord, but that we are loved by you, and that we get an opportunity to love you as well. Father, help us to love you. Help us to grow in our faith. Help us to grow in our trust of who you are and to go boldly into the world that you've called us to go out into. In your name we pray, amen. All right. Well, thanks, Pat. Appreciate you uh, bringing God's word to us this morning. And um, just, you know, I really appreciate uh, Patrick and his desire to uh, work out this call of the Lord on his life and for he and Brenna and their family. And uh, it's important for us to know as a church family that we get to invest in this. We get to cheer them on and encourage them uh, to capture all that God has uh, in store for them. And, uh, and so it's also fitting for us to be able just to share a little update to let you know that 
Uh, Pat's been entered, has entered into the credentialing phase with the EMCC, our denomination of church churches. And, uh, and so he's kind of taking that first step to becoming a credentialed minister and uh, filling out uh, some, a lot of paperwork, answering a lot of doctrinal questions and, and things like that. And so continue to pray for him and for, for Brenna and, uh, and their family. Uh, Elsie and Porter and a new baby to be uh, coming into their home this spring as well. Very exciting. And uh, and if you've uh, if you've been encouraged uh, by something you've heard, then I, I encourage you to let him know as well. It's always helpful. Uh, that's a, a great way for us to respond in this. And so uh, and then another reminder, just as Pat said, today is SEMC. Uh, chili and hot dog day. You can take a picture of your of your chili lunch or your hot dog lunch or both of them together with the hashtag SEMC Chili Dog Sunday, and uh, put it there on our, our Facebook page or on the Instagram, and and we'll find it and be a great great opportunity for us to celebrate together, even though we're apart. And uh, and lastly, let me send you off with this uh, benediction. Uh, as we as we reflect on this message that we've heard and I guess for me as I reflect on it too you know there's so many competing voices uh, for us in, in the world in which we live the day as we move through a day so many voices digital voices as well as audible voices and what are we listening to who are we listening to may we be those who listen to the creator of the universe the redeemer of our souls uh, even Jesus our Lord. And this benediction from the book of Hebrews is very fitting. Now may the God of peace, who through the eternal, who through the who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may be may he be at work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I heard that. Thanks so much for joining us. Keep well, wash your hands, and let's go make a kingdom difference.